Oh, hello there. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome, welcome. It's February 8th, 2022, and live from New York, it's Tuesday night. Welcome to the February speaker meeting of the Linnaean Society of New York. My name is Ken Chea. I'm the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I would now like to call this meeting to order. Well, it was a beautiful morning today in New York City. The sun was out. The sky was a brilliant cerulean blue, and the temperature reached 45 degrees. The Hudson River still had flows of ice that were flowing downstream and rapidly melting into the current, turning the river's surface uh, a flowing pattern of icy blue and white. It was beautiful. At times, it looked like marble. The bare tree branches are now supporting thousands and thousands of tiny buds. Some are leaf buds, some are flower buds, and each one is packed with the promise of spring yet to come. Now we still have plenty of winter ahead of us, uh, but for the moment, uh, this morning, I felt that, that little tug, you know, that one that says everything changes and change is the only constant in our world. Spring is coming. And I plan to be out there to see it arrive. And I hope you will join me and be out there too. So on with the meeting. According to my participants list, I see we have 85 people out there watching live. And here's 86 and 87 coming up. They're still coming in the door. Great. Uh, so once again, a very warm welcome to everyone for joining us tonight. I'm very excited about this evening's speaker. Tonight we have Dr. John Marsloff with us, who will be sharing his research on ravens in Yellowstone Park in Rendezvous with the Raven, exploring connections among the trickster, wolves, and people. For tonight's program, we have disabled the Zoom chat feature, as well as the video and microphone. The Q&A feature is fully functional, however, and during this evening's program, we encourage you to use that feature at the bottom of your screen. See it down there? And send us any questions you may have for our speaker. Following the presentation, we will take some time to select a few questions for Dr. Marsla. Before we get underway with tonight's program, I have a few business items to cover, including the most recent results of our members voting, how to become a Linnaean Society member, and news about our upcoming annual meeting in March. First, I'll report on the recent voting of our membership. And thank you again, by the way, to all of you dedicated members who send in your votes promptly. Motion number one, to accept the January 2022 meeting minutes passed unanimously by a vote of 156 to zero with one abstention. We also have some new members to welcome to this society tonight. And you know, I'd like to add at this time that since we've been delivering this meeting on Zoom, that would be September of 2020, we've had the pleasure of welcoming new members each and every month. And this month is no different. This is significant. And I wish to thank the board of directors and all of you members out there who sponsored new members and who make the society really such a success and attractive to so many. Thank you. Keep up the great work. On motion two, with 155 votes of approval and zero votes of opposition, two votes of abstention, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the following applicants as new members of the Linnaean Society of New York. Joel Golombek, sponsored by Judy Rabbi. Matthew Fischer, sponsored by Debbie Mullins. Deborah Shapiro, sponsored by Susan Axelrod. Diane Schenker, sponsored by Sylvia Alexander. So if any of you newly 
elected members are out there right now. Joel, Matthew, Deborah, and Diane, congratulations to all and a very, very warm welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. Item number two, if anyone is wondering, how do I become a member? It's really simple. Just go to our website, linnaeannewyork.org, and you will find all the information there that you need to apply. In case you need a sponsor, and perhaps you don't know that many Linnaean members just yet, don't worry about a thing. We're a friendly and welcoming group. In fact, if you need a sponsor, you may contact me. I'll be happy to sponsor you. In addition, you may contact any of our other officers uh, uh, about sponsorship, the vice president, the treasurer, secretary, uh, the editor. All of our email addresses may be found at the bottom of our website's homepage under contacts. So just click on contacts and write to any of us officers about sponsorship or for more information. And please remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We welcome all to become members of the Linnaean Society of New York, regardless of race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, background, ability, or geographic location. We're a friendly group and we would be delighted to hear from you. So if you love birds and nature and care about the environment, and you wanna meet people who share those same interests, we'd be happy to welcome you to our inclusive community of birders and naturalists. So check us out. Item number three, I'd like to update everyone on the society's annual meeting. Our annual meeting will be held again online this year using Zoom, just as we're doing tonight, the 144th annual meeting of the Linnaean Society of New York will take place on Tuesday evening, March 8th at 7 p.m. and will feature biologists and conservation social scientist and Eisenman Award winner, Dr. Jennifer Duberstein. Please mark your calendars for March 8th at 7 p.m. and plan to join us. A formal invitation to all members will be arriving very soon via email or post. Please watch for it and remember to register in order to attend the online annual meeting. And please note this online meeting is only open to Linnaean members and their guests. On the night of the annual meeting, voting for a new slate of officers and a new slate of board directors will take place electronically, just as we do each month for our meeting minutes and to approve new members. Immediately following the annual meeting, all members of the society will receive an email asking for them to vote within 24 hours. Please remember to watch for this important email on the evening of March 8th, since it does have a 24 hour deadline. So please look for that and vote promptly. And finally, a reminder that in my February 3rd president's letter, all members were invited to submit nominations from the floor for three open positions on the board. In accordance with our bylaws, a nominating committee has been formed to submit nominations for these three open positions. If there are additional nominations from the floor, however, please note that they are due to our secretary at secretary at linnaeannewyork.org by midnight. February 21st. Please refer to your February president's letter email for further information. And now for tonight's feature presentation. Ravens are known to scavenge from wolves and people, but the degree to which they exploit these and other resources of food has not been studied in detail. In 2019, John Marslove 
and Matthias Loretto began tagging ravens in Yellowstone National Park with long lasting satellite transmitters. After tagging more than 60 ravens and relating their movements to those of people and wolves, they gained an appreciation of the reliance on both as providers of food. In tonight's talk, Dr. Marsloff will describe how the movements of ravens can be related to wolf and human provisioned foods. Focusing on how the exploits of these individual birds demonstrate variability. The team observed ravens at wolf kills, but it appeared that these discoveries were incidental rather than the result of the ravens purposefully searching for them. As we begin to quantify the relationship between wolves and ravens, we may learn more about their synchrony, but at present it appears to be weak with discovery of kills occurring during the day rather than after communal roosting. Ravens made extensive use of anthropogenic resources, including direct handouts, wastewater treatment ponds, dumps, agriculture, road kills, and hunter offal. Territorial ravens have extensive knowledge of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and exploit areas in excess of 6,500 square miles. John Marsloff is the James W. Ridgway Professor of Wildlife Science at the University of Washington. His graduate research and initial postdoctoral research focused on the social behavior and ecology of jays and ravens. He continues his work investigating the intriguing behavior of crows, ravens, and jays, and currently focuses on the interactions of ravens and wolves in Yellowstone National Park. He teaches courses in anthropology, uh, in, excuse me, in ornithology, governance and conservation of rare species, field research in Yellowstone, and the natural and cultural history of Costa Rica. Professor Mosloff has written six books and authored over 140 scientific papers. He's a member of the US Fish and Wildlife Services Recovery Team for the Critically Endangered Mariana Crow, a fellow of the American Ornithologist Union and a National Geographic Explorer. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Marsloff. John. Thanks, Ken. I was afraid I was going to have to teach anthropology next quarter or something. <laughs> Thanks for getting me off the hook there. It's my pleasure to be with you all tonight and share some of our ongoing work on ravens in Yellowstone and answering questions uh, that, that could arise from viewing these uh, preliminary results. I'll start sharing my screen. All right, so we are gonna track the trickster tonight uh, and their interactions with, with us, people on the landscape, as well as wolves and other carnivores in the Yellowstone landscape. The really unique thing about Yellowstone is that we have all of these components, a full functioning ecosystem of, of bears, wolves, lions, and people in, of all sorts around the park and in the park. And it's interesting to be able to see how these birds are able to utilize all of those resources. I hope to give you appreciation for some of that here tonight. The raven is one of the most adaptable species on earth and one of the most successful species of birds as shown in this graph just from Montana that shows the population trajectory of this species over time. And certainly this graph could be drawn for just about anywhere in the US, certainly anywhere west of the 50th meridian, uh, you would see this sort of a increase as these birds have taken advantage of what we've done to the land and utilize the resources we and others provide. They've influenced our culture as well, uh, not just uh, the ecosystems that they live in, but the human ecosystem as well. This drawing from my artist friend, Tony Angel, uh, shows this trajectory through time, starting with ravens as scavengers before people had evolved with uh, scavenging from other carnivores and in the company of 
condors and other species. And then through time, as these birds interacted more and more with us, we developed religions based upon them, legends based upon them, both here in the New World and in the Old, uh, where Scandinavians had the beliefs that ravens would inform their uh, gods about the, the workings of the world each day. And on through to modern times, where these species have influenced our feelings about death and, and dangerous items to approach, as, as we've seen from uh, pop culture like Hitchcock's The Birds. And, and I'm sure you've noticed, uh, if you're a birder, that anytime something bad's going to happen in a movie, you probably hear a crow or a raven croaking in the background. That's because of this long standing co evolution between people and these birds. So tonight I want to tell you a little bit about their biology and a little bit about their uh, experiences that we've gained from them in the Yellowstone area. And I'll end with a bit of a concern about this increase that you see again here uh, on other animals that these individual, uh, that this species preys upon. And just to note, our work is supported uh, by the University of Washington, the National Geographic Society, and the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior. So let's start with a broad perspective about raven evolution. Uh, so we're, uh, we understand where these animals came from. As I said, they were here well before humans were, and uh, they have crossed uh, over into the, the new world from the old world uh, several times over the past million years. And this has had a great influence on their evolution. But starting back four or so million years ago in Africa, uh, a common ancestor of ravens evolved and gave rise to the common raven, which spread throughout uh, Northern Africa into Europe and, and across into Asia. Eventually, about 2 million years ago, these birds were able to cross Beringia, that, that land uh, mass between, or that connects really uh, the Russian Far East with Alaska. In times when there are glaciers on the planet, seawater is used, uh, is reduced, and landforms uh, occur, such as Beringia. And during that time, the animals that live across that, uh, that land bridge, it's really a quite extensive area, uh, they come to be isolated on either side of the, the world, depending upon the rising and falling of, of sea level. So about 2 million years ago, ravens came across from the old world into the new world, and then were isolated in both places as glaciers melted, seawater rose, Beringia flooded. So we had common ravens in the new world evolving separately on a distinct course from those in the old world, uh, just accumulating random mutations and differences in their DNA over this, this time period, during which the old world ravens gave rise to a new species in the old world, the Canary Island raven, and the common ravens in the new world gave rise to a new species, the Chihuahuan raven. But these two parental forms continued to evolve differences over time. Differences that might have led to two species, one old and one new world raven. If it were not for a second invasion of the new world by ravens only about 15,000 years ago, at the time when humans came across Beringia, when wolves came across Beringia, so too did ravens, sometime in the 15 to 30,000 year period. And at this time, Old world ravens again invaded the new world and they interbreed freely with the old world ravens that were already here starting to become different. So this was a speciation process in progress that was halted and reversed by this recolonization of the new world by the old world birds. And although we can detect very distinct genetic differences between these two invasions now in common ravens, the ravens don't seem to care. They interbreed with one another freely, and they do it quite successfully. So let's talk about raven biology a bit. And this first uh, illustration here is just to show you that uh, ravens uh, form long-term pair bonds. Here's a pair of ravens in Yellowstone, and it's a not uncommon, like for crows, uh, to see them allopreening one another. And these, these males and females stay mated for their life but quickly remate if, uh, if indeed they need to, if one of the members dies. In addition to this core social organization of paired ravens, there are non-paired individuals, which we call vagrant non-breeders. 
And this phase can last for, for many, many years. We don't fully understand how long yet and how they transition from being a vagrant non-breeder to a territorial breeder, but certainly status and dominance is involved. Dominant, uh, dominance is related to age and whether you're a breeder or not in this uh, species. And, and breeders are dominant to non-breeders. Older birds uh, often uh, become breeders over time as they gain status and dominance in the group and are able to carve out a territory that they can successfully defend from these guys, these, these non-breeding uh, vagrant birds, which will often flock uh, together at a food resource, not in a, not in a way that's got a permanent organization, but one that's quite fluid. And you might have the same individuals together for some of the time and not for others at some places and not other places. But a collection of ravens uh, is not uncommon to see at these sorts of uh, food sources. So these two social function, social groups interact when it comes to finding and exploiting rare foods. Like in this case where um, we have a dead moose that has occurred in the Northeast and this moose is a valuable rare resource. By chance, it might land in a territorial pair's uh, domain and they would defend and eat that moose as shown in the first panel here quietly, keeping the, the secret as best they could this location of this animal because it could serve their uh, purposes for the whole winter. But eventually a non-breeding vagrant bird cruising through the area will discover this. They will try to eat there. They will be attacked by these uh, dominant birds. And as they're attacked, they'll beg and they'll make yelling like sounds that attract other ravens from the nearby area until a small group assembles there and eventually goes back to a communal roost at night of vagrants. And these individuals that are at this roost, if they're looking for a place to eat, they will follow birds in the morning that might lead them back to this sort of a, a rich food discovery. When there's nine or more ravens at a, at a carcass like this, the territorial birds quit fighting them and they share that food. And by share, I mean that in a very loose way. It's a very selfish behavior. Um, of these vagrants to attract others in and share the food with them because in so doing, they, they're able to overpower these dominant territorial birds. And the dominant birds just share with them because they, it's not worth them fighting every individual off from this food resource. So it's a kind of cooperation, but it's based upon selfish and re reciprocal interactions. In Yellowstone, this uh, this relationship may be a bit different because here we've got carnivores, as, as I said, wolves in particular, that quickly make kills and consume a, a tremendous amount of them. And yet we still have an assembly of ravens, as you can see here, at this wolf-killed young elk. Uh, and not only do we have uh, ravens, but other consumers as well. Here's a young bald eagle sitting right atop this elk. So a, a, a resource like this is produced not infrequently, and it's gone pretty quickly. So the, the assembly of individuals from a communal roost to exploit these uh, may be a little different, or this information exchange, as we call it at a roost site among non-breeding -va non vagrants might be a little different here. And we were interested in knowing that. Likewise, these birds have access to other more stable resources, such as dumpsters or wastewater treatment plants where they fish grease out of the water. And of course, they can beg from, uh, from tourists, and they do that quite effectively. So how do these things play into the, the lifestyle of ravens in Yellowstone? We started to get a feel for this, as, as Ken said, by tagging birds. And uh, to tag them, we had to first catch them. To catch them, we use a net launcher, and you'll see a quick demonstration of that in this video. Here's our trap hidden over here. Three birds are feeding at a piece of bison that wolves have pulled out of a nearby pond. And when we think they're in a good position, we can fire that net. And in this case, we we're lucky enough to catch two of the three birds. We then tag those birds with satellite transmitters. These are actually transmitters that relay their precise GPS locations to the cell network, which is then uploaded to a server in Germany. And I can download it on my computer whenever I'm curious to see what our birds are doing. Uh, these, these transmitters do have solar panels, and in that way, um, they, they should be able to last for many years. Of course, the ravens might have different 
feelings about how long those will last, and they certainly do uh, take, take their ire out on them. My collaborator with this, who you just saw putting that transmitter on, is Matthias Loretto. And Matthias is a professor in Germany, and he's a Raven expert and was lucky enough to be funded by the European Union and um, the Max Planck Institute to allow us to put on um, now uh, over 70 transmitters and follow the movements of these birds. In addition to Matthias, Doug Smith and Dan Staler uh, and Lauren Walker at the National Park have all contributed. They provide information on what wolves and pumas and other carnivores are doing so we can relate these animals together. And the, the field teams that are studying wolves and cougars also are extremely helpful in pointing us in the right direction of where to see our birds interacting with their uh, carnivores. And a couple of undergrads in particular for today's presentation here at the University of Washington, Cameron Ho and Georgia Coleman contributed to, to our work here. One of the first things we found is that, again, that ravens exploit many different food types. And it's not surprising, these are supreme generalist species. But the, the seasonality of their exploitation was interesting. For example, in the spring and again in the autumn, they exploit gut piles that are left by hunters. In the autumn, these are, these are regular deer and elk hunters that are quite um, abundant in the area right outside of the park. And in the spring, these are indigenous hunters that are harvesting bison and elk that have moved out of the park for the winter. And the ravens know about both of these things and they cue in on them immediately and take advantage. When they're not eating gut piles, they're eating primarily uh, invertebrates that are dispersed throughout the mostly grassland or upper elevation reaches of the park. They're flipping bison patties and getting um, grubs. They're going to the streams and harvesting salmon flies as they hatch. And they're hitting grasshoppers and ladybug beetles, ladybird beetles later in the season. They're also uh, spending time at waste uh, treatment facilities. They are hitting uh, roadkill carcasses and winter kill carcasses, especially during uh, the, the harsh winter season. And they're hitting agriculture and wolves uh, less frequently and more consistently over time. So let's look at some of the movements and the way these animals exploit these different resources. First, think about a breeding raven. They've got other constraints. They're not able to just uh, go out and look for food, they have to bring it back to their nest. So their movements, as we might expect, are fairly constrained. For example, all these little dots are the locations of one of our breeding ravens uh, during the breeding season, May to August. Her nest was right here, and she ventured up to seven or eight miles, but mostly all within just a few miles of her nest all summer, working people and natural resources there. She was successful in this case, produced these three fledglings, and she nested in a forested situation, unlike the, um, the cliff that I just showed you. So they're very uh, flexible in where they nest. Soon as the breeding season is over, it's hunting season outside of the park. And this bird started commuting daily up to almost 60 miles one way every day to exploit this food, come back to her territory, exploit the food and come back. Sometimes she went to other places. This was quite surprising to us as we didn't really expect her uh, to leave her territory. We thought territorial birds pretty much stayed right there. So why go up to this Northwest part of the, of the area just outside of Yellowstone? Well, as I said, there are gut piles that are provided during this time of year, especially in this hunting area and over here. And there are also dumps and wastewater treatment plants uh, where these animals concentrated their activities. So they're taking advantage of subsidies that humans are providing in the environment uh, as soon as they're free from tending their nestlings. Now their, their nestlings and juveniles in particular tend to wander widely after uh, fledging and finally settle into some more consistent anthropogenic resource. For example, this individual bird we tagged here in the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone. And over the course of the next six months, it wandered to the north and a little bit to the west and ended up in the agricultural areas here in Alberta. The dots that are on here show, again, some of the anthropogenic subsidies that this bird used. One, the red dots indicate communal roosts that it shared with up to uh, several thousand other ravens on a power line. And the yellow dots are food sources 
that were associated with people and in particular where it settled in for for now and still lives there um, two years later is agricultural setting up in Alberta. This distance, this uh, 380 or so miles is a record dispersal distance for a common rate. Older non-breeders also travel a lot. One individual we trapped, I'm gonna demonstrate here over a course of time for you. We trapped him on, a, on the roadway and this was an unusual bird. It was known by the construction crew that was working on the, the highway there in, in Yellowstone as Bernie. And Bernie had a habit of, of being out there and meeting the construction crew every day and walking down the line of cars that they had stopped for their construction work and basically begging from every car down the line. It walked right down the middle of the road and in the, on the yellow lines and was pretty successful at extorting food from the people that were stopped there waiting for construction to let them pass. Uh, so when we first caught him, there was just the end of the construction and he stayed in a very uh, nearby close area to, the, to where we caught him for the next several days. And just for perspective, uh, here's Yellowstone Lake, huge lake. And here, uh, way up here is that area we were just looking at around Gardner where those birds go to forage on gut piles. So that's in, in fact what Bernie did that first fall, just like the bird that we had tagged way down here in the park that I showed you earlier, he started going up to the Northwest to, to eat uh, gut piles. He expanded a bit during the winter uh, up to other human resources over here, a small city and up here further in the Paradise Valley. Again, right before coronavirus hit, uh, we had this bird tag, so we were interested in comparing his uh, movements before and after the park was closed for three months for the corona uh, virus. The green area here are his movements right before that. The pink area is what he did when the park was closed, wandering even further, exploring new areas uh, in search of foods because some of his reliable sources, tourists, uh, were excluded. He then moved down uh, for the summer, way down south here, the Grand Tetons for perspective. Turned back up for hunting uh, in the area here that he had been to previously the next autumn and headed back down south again after that. Over the course of the, the year, he covered about 6,500 square miles, quite a distance uh, for a bird, over 500 miles on this perimeter that he covered. And I think he knew this area very well. He knew what was available when and where. To put in perspective, some of the other birds we've looked at now, uh, since I gave Ken those numbers, we have some that have covered 15,000 square miles. Well, let's look at some of the individual strategies of these birds. In general, we have these difference between vagrant and, and territorial birds, but some of the individuals in those categories specialize on different foods. First off, let's look at those that, that really take advantage of the wolves that are in the park and were reintroduced in the mid 90s. And here you see a typical scene. If you've been there, you'll see wolves foraging on a bison that they killed earlier in the day that's also being scavenged by ravens and eagles and magpies in this case. And it's not uncommon if you see wolves to see ravens with them. This was uh, the results of a study done right uh, soon after the wolves were reintroduced by Dan Staler and Bern Heinrich. And what, what they found was that over all the activities, whenever they saw wolves, 86 and a half percent of the time, there was a raven in association with them. And that's very different if you look at coyotes, only about 3% of the time would you see a raven with a coyote. So they're clearly attracted and associate with wolves. But how is this a tight personal relationship? Do some ravens have friendly wolves that they interact with? Do they interact with the same wolves over time? Those are some of the questions we were, answered, we were trying to answer. We noted right away in, in our first year after tagging that about half of the wolf kills that uh, Dan, who's a, who is now a research biologist in the park and, and his teams had found, uh, were also visited by at least one of our tagged birds. And a couple of kills were visited by up to a dozen of the birds we had tagged. While about a third of the birds we tagged were never observed at a wolf kill. And a lot of these were, uh, were the juveniles that we tagged. Um, some were, were observed quite regularly. About a quarter of their 
quarter of the birds we tagged were observed at at least five different wolf kills during this first winter. Most of these birds were adults, the gray bar, or uh, older vagrant birds. We never observed our juveniles to be this frequent at wolf kills. There were some that were at you know, a few wolf kills, but the real dominant wolfers in our system are territorial birds that live in the Lamar Valley where the wolves are, are frequent and older vagrant birds that come into the valley uh, to exploit these wolves. So let's look at how some of these territorial birds exploit them. Here, for example, the pink dots are the movements and locations of one of our territorial uh, birds. She nests right over here. And at this time, you can see that she went up and exploited a wolf kill here. These big dots, the big circles, are locations of wolves. And she's coincident with the wolves at this point, at this point, over here, and over here. And she's exploiting these over a range of about 10 miles, uh, sometimes more frequent, or more distant, I should say. But oftentimes, these territorial birds in the valley exploit these wolves when they're nearby and they make a kill. Sometimes they even follow wolves. So here's that same female. Uh, she was on her territory here. She flew out into, this is the Lamar Valley, flew out into the valley to meet this wolf. This is a, a tagged um, immature uh, yearling wolf. A female, and this female, the blue dots moved across the landscape here. This is called um, Amethyst Mountain into Amethyst Creek, where all of her pack mates were. The different color dots here represent different tagged wolves, and they were on probably some sort of a carcass here. We don't know of, of this, and the wolf team didn't know of one here, but you can see they're really piled in here, and this female raven followed right along with them and stayed there the rest of the day almost certainly feeding upon a, a kill of some sort. If we are able to watch the kills, sometimes we can do this and we can see the dynamic of how ravens and wolves interact over time. And that's what I'm showing you here. For four days that I was watching uh, elk kill uh, by the junction uh, pack of wolves in the Lamar Valley. So this was in uh, a couple of years ago, and I was observing uh, and saw wolves with one raven in tow. A few minutes later, uh, they had the wolves had flushed a bull elk from the timber and killed it, and there were four ravens immediately with the wolves at that time. Throughout the course of that day after the kill was made, uh, about 15 ravens I, that was the most I ever counted at the kill during that day. They didn't get a lot of feeding in because the wolves were there eating at that time, but they got in eventually and, and, and got some food. As night fell, the ravens left to go to roost. The next morning, there, were, there was a bigger group that morning suggesting that maybe some ravens were recruited from the roost at night. And in fact, one of our tag birds appeared to be so. During that day, the number of ravens bounces up and down as wolves chase them away, or foxes or eagles chase them away, or coyotes, uh, but basically increases to about 33 later in that day. So there's a lot of accumulation within a day here during that first day after the kill, and in the second day, an increase in the number of ravens over time as individuals find this location and feed on it, independent of using a roost at night. And then as the food is mostly consumed, the ravens go away, as do the wolves. Another situation is shown here where a kill was made at night and discovered at first light by uh, one raven. Quickly thereafter, there were four and then 33 all within that day. Those birds were attracted individually uh, to this carcass and did not use communication at the roost like we saw in Maine or in, in, in the Northeast uh, to attract individuals. And then during the day, their, their numbers fluctuate with the wolves. They increase a little bit the next day and then decline as the food is eaten. Now in Maine, uh, my wife and I studied this with Bern Heinrich, and we saw a very different pattern. What we saw there was a rapid buildup from one day to the next. For example, here's a deer, these open circles. And we, had, we went from five birds to over 40 in one, over one night. This was attraction from a communal roost. Likewise, at a bigger carcass, a cow, uh, we go from having just a, a few individuals to 20, and then from 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 from one day to the next. So not discovery during the day, but communication 
and a following of individuals from a communal roots to learn where these foods are located. Very different than this buildup within a day and quick exploitation of that food in Yellowstone. Here, even a deer in Maine could last 10 days. A cow would last almost a month. Nothing lasts a month in Yellowstone. Well, let's look at the movement of some of our territorial birds and, non -vag and vagrant birds at this wolf kill. So this was the last one I showed you uh, that was killed at night and then discovered during the day. So here's where the kill is on the land. There's some purple dots and red dots nearby. Those are territorial birds that live there. And there are some green and yellow dots far away. These are, um, these are second year males that basically um, don't know anything about this kill at this time. So that first day, those territorial birds that are centered here to the south or up here to the north uh, east were at the kill. One was there at 7.30 in that, that first morning. So attracted by the noise and commotion, maybe of the wolves, maybe of the other ravens there in a process we call local enhancement. Local cues uh, directed them to this kill. Interestingly, the next day, that bird that we had tagged that was over in Bozeman area had been roosting in the forest there in the mountains here, took a 140 mile trip past the kill, circled back around and went to the wolf kill that day. Similarly, a, that bird that was over by Billings at, at a landfill and had, and had been there for several weeks, all of a sudden decides to fly straight line uh, 100 miles to that kill. We know this isn't something that's going on at a roost. This ha these birds both came in during the day, uh, for instance, but we also had many tag birds at a roost close to this wolf kill many of which went back to the West and didn't come to the kill, only one of which did come to the kill. So roosts play a part, but a minor part in the buildup of these birds at kills. So how in the heck does a bird who lives over here find out about a wolf kill way over here, 100 miles away? I, I didn't mention, but this mountain range that that bird flew over, that's the highest mountain range in Montana. And it flew right over the tallest peak, Granite Peak. This is that bird's movements for two years now that we followed it. The, the track that I just showed you coming in from the roost here in Billings over those high mountains is shown right here into this kill that was about there. So how in the heck do they know about it? I don't think he had a clue about it. I, I don't think it was all that important for us to even try to figure out how he knew about it. I think the more interesting question is how in the heck did he decide to leave the comfort of this dump where he was foraging. And as we looked over the years before and after the kill I just told you about, this wasn't his first trip into the park from this roost. Here's, a, here's one here, another here, another here, and another one here. This bird knows this route. He's done this before, and he's following basically, um, I think, not so much food, but the ability to interact with other ravens. This is what happens at a kill uh, like the one we were just talking about. There's some feeding, these birds are eating, but there's a lot of posturing, there's a lot of dancing. This bird is in a dominant posture. This bird is subordinate based upon its head feathers. This bird is dominant, maybe challenging this bird. These birds aren't even concerned with food, they're, they're dealing with themselves interacting with one another, as are these guys way over here. The real attraction to coming into these foods for what we see now, older non-breeding uh, birds from more stable resources, coming into places like this, I think is to display to one another, to maybe see where they stand in the dominance hierarchy, maybe to find a mate, maybe to assess if there's a territory opening nearby this kill that they might try to, uh, to sneak into and move up in the hierarchy. So food is part of it, they eat, but it's not key. They might in fact come in at times like this bird did and not find any food here until they get way down here and find another kill. Or if they find nothing at all, they'll continue with this circuit. And they might end up over uh, at the, in the Paradise Valley where there's lots of human resources. They might even come all the way back around uh, and uh, a route of several hundred miles, which isn't, doesn't seem to be difficult for these ravens to cover and occasionally pays off at a wolf kill and surprises us at, wow, how'd they find that? 
Well, all they did was look and listen during these long flights. And these flights are looking for other ravens and potential foods. Well, ravens certainly benefit from, from the kills that wolves make, but do wolves get anything out of this association? We can use our data and that of the wolf team to again, look at this relationship. There's been a lot of speculation that ravens might point out kills to wolves. And I've never been a big believer in that because wolves are pretty good at finding things to eat on their own. But what we see in this, uh, this image and the next several are gonna be locations where we had ravens feeding the yellow balloons here and here. These are where we had a collection of ravens where the wolf team didn't know about a wolf kill. And in this case, there are, there's a wolf, the red dots, in association with our group of ravens, the yellow balloon, at this carcass at the same time, which suggests to me that kind of like I showed you for that female in the Lamar, this is a wolf kill that our ravens discovered and are exploiting with them. But over here is, a, is an accumulation of ravens with no wolves. The wolf pack is way down here, uh, quite a ways away from this uh, kill or this collection of ravens is all we know. Over the next day, the, the leaders of that pack, the, the male and female get close to that accumulation of ravens, but they're not at it yet. But on day two, they're right there and the other members of their pack are close by as well. And on day three, they eat together. They're all there at this site together, suggesting indeed it, there was a food source, probably a winter killed bison, something like that. And then the wolves leave and head back to the, to the Southwest. And the ravens remained there. So this suggested to me that ravens found that uh, food source. They were exploiting it, making a lot of noise around it and wolves took advantage of that information. Or maybe wolves just smelled it or found it on their own. But we can't rule out the fact that they used ravens in this case. We have several instances of this. And about half the time we see uh, wolves maybe coming after ravens. And about half the time they're there together, suggesting that, they, that the ravens and wolves have found kills that we didn't know about. But also that about half the time ravens find uh, kills that wolves didn't know about. But if you add in all the times they're at wolf kills, there's still a six-fold greater benefit to ravens than to wolves in their this association. So really, it's a parasitic relationship, and it's asymmetrical. Ravens benefit much more than wolves. In contrast, the cougar and raven association is much more one-sided. Cougars, really, uh, we don't have any evidence of them finding food to scavenge after a raven had been there. But we have several instances where cougars were there before ravens and uh, about half of the cougar kills we monitored also were exploited by ravens. Well, let's go beyond the carnivore relationship here and look at some of the other food sources for ravens in Yellowstone. And we're one of the prime ones. This is a, a bird begging from this tourist who ended up tossing the bird part of his ham sandwich. Another bird that we have tagged is known as Stevie. And Stevie uh, exploits all the people in and around Cook City, Montana, at the northeast part of the park. Here's a woman who feeds Stevie. She works at a nearby bar, brings home roast beef on Wednesdays. Uh, it's roast beef night at the bar. She brings it home and, and feeds it to Stevie. She was so concerned about Stevie breaking her window because she would pound on this window so hard with her beak that she hung a bell. And when Stevie rings the bell, as she's doing here, uh, the lady comes out and gives Stevie a reward. Now, Stevie doesn't just live in Cook City. Uh, this is Cook City, where, where she does spend a lot of time. But he travels all over, almost that whole route to that other non-breeder travels that I showed you. And I noticed one concentration of his locations here outside of Cook City, uh, about five miles away in the wilderness uh, by this lake. And about the that same time, I got an email from a lawyer saying a friend of his was uh, curious about a raven that was hanging out in his cabin. And in fact, if you look under that cloud of points where Stevie was, you would see this cabin. And I was curious, and we decided we should hike in and, and check this out, see who this guy is who lives at this cabin in the wilderness, figuring he was probably a, a rather salty uh, person that might be interesting to talk to. So we hiked in. 
and we found the former lieutenant governor of South Dakota. He owns the cabin and lives there and has formed a strong bond with Stevie as well. So Stevie's working him for chips and other foods, working the, the barmaid in Cook City for roast beef. That's a pretty good life. She's not mated. And I don't know if she's ever going to give up on people for a raven, but she's she's got a pretty good deal going right now. Other ravens are not so nice to people. Instead, they steal things. Here in the Grand Canyon is a raven ripping into a backpack to take out uh, what might hope would be a sandwich, but doesn't find anything really worth eating here and just rifles through the pack throwing uh, things around. And in Yellowstone, ravens are reported to do this in Old Faithful. So I went in there in the winter uh, to see this for myself. We had a couple of ravens tagged here. Here's an aerial view of the development around uh, Old Faithful and the cloud of points from two of our tagged birds there, a territorial female here and here that you can see split up the, the park uh, or split up the Old Faithful area pretty much in half. They go their different ways for the most part, one going to the west, one going up to the, to the northwest. And they exploit the tourists that are there in the wintertime for snowmobile tours. But um, the snowmobiles have been adapted over time to now have hard-sided locking saddlebags. These used to be kind of backpack-like. Uh, held together with Velcro or zippers, and those were readily opened and rifled through by ravens, much as that one in Grand Canyon was doing. Now the ravens in Yellowstone can't do that because the tour guides have changed uh, the kind of um, snowmobiles they use, and the ravens haven't figured out how to open these locking boxes yet. Now ravens and humans have co-evolved, as I said, early on in the talk, and they've influenced our culture, we've influenced theirs, in much of a, in certain cases, kind of like an arms race. And that's what we're seeing here in Yellowstone now, because as ravens are unable to get into these saddlebags, they're starting to rip up the snowmobiles. Here's a torn area in the um, seat of this brand new skidoo that has been ripped into it by a raven. And what the next step in this coevolution will be, I don't know if uh, the snowmobiles will, snowmobiles will have to get uh, more raven proof sleds or if the ravens will finally figure out how to get into those compartments. But it's interesting to watch. Well, let me just end up by coming back to this graph that shows the increase in ravens. As I said, this could be anywhere in the Western US and lots of other places in the world. And to me, it's great. I'm, I mean, I like ravens. I'm curious about how they do this. It's an interesting phenomenon, but they do eat endangered species like snowy plovers greater uh, sage grouse and desert tortoises. And that's a concern for the conservation of those species as well. So the response uh, to date to deal with this has been basically to kill ravens. And here's a plot of the number of ravens killed annually over the years from 95 to, to today uh, that are killed by the federal government, the, depart or the um, US Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services. These guys kill a lot of stuff on, in be the name of agriculture or humans, or in this case, some of it for endangered species. But it's not effectual. And I don't think it is, um, I don't think it's justified because we are not doing anything about the subsidies. I've shown you tonight that these birds use power lines to roost on. They nest in a variety of places, some of which are human uh, sources. And they eat a tremendous amount of things that we have put food on the landscape. And these subsidies should be controlled first, I think, before we then try to control the ravens directly. In fact, controlling subsidies around places of conservation concern has been shown to be pretty effective at reducing corvid use of those areas and therefore the influence of those um, generalist predators on the prey species that we are also concerned about. So my pitch is to understand what subsidies these birds are using, take those out of the landscape. There's a variety of cool ways we can do that. Everything from incentivizing people to pick up uh, the things they're leaving, be it a gut pile or uh, a sandwich, to having lasers that will reduce the use of these birds at places that they gather like sewage treatment ponds and garbage dumps. So there's a lot of work to be done there to understand more and to limit the raven's use of these resources and their effects on other species. 
So with that, I would thank you again for your attention. Glad to take questions. I would invite you to visit my, uh, my lab uh, website, Avian Conservation Lab at the University of Washington, if you want to get uh, papers that we've done on these topics. If you want to track our birds, you can do that using this free app from Max Max Planck Institute it's called Animal Tracker. If you want to learn more about crow behavior and track crows, you can get a free app that we've done about that uh, called Crow Scientist. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and, and hopefully take some questions. This. Everybody still awake? Hang on one second. We're uh... <laughs> hello, John. <laughs> it's yeah. always a strange feeling. You never know what's going on out there. <laughs> no, awake. That was uh, that was just fantastic. Um, I just lost my screen momentarily, uh, but wow, what a fantastic talk! Thank you so much, John. Um, Without a vice president to assist me tonight, who is off in Costa Rica somewhere, the lucky stiff, um, I will be uh, moderating the Q and A uh, beginning right now. So, um, members in attendance and guests, and by the way, there were 126 people on tonight. Uh, so I know some of you have some questions. Uh, you may begin to uh, add those questions into the Q and A feature, and um, and John and I will. Um, we'll begin to talk about them and discuss them together. But um, that was a fascinating program. And uh, I also want to, uh, I also want to plug your use of illustration. You had everything from charts and diagrams, documenting the hard science to some beautiful, beautiful video footage and some lovely black and white illustrations that may have come from your friend that who you credited earlier. So uh, really a beautifully illustrated program, as well as the uh, uh, fascinating nature and science content. Kudos to you, John. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, I love working with artists. I've, I've had the pleasure of working with several. Tony Angel, in particular, who does the black and white images that you saw. And he and I have collaborated a couple of times on, on books about crows and ravens with those images in it. Very good. And uh, speaking of books, um, our past vice president, who is not with us tonight, has uh, raved about your book, Suburbia. And uh, I, I, I do look forward to uh, reading that myself um, this year. Um, but she, has, uh, she had a lot to tell me about that. And she was really upset that she couldn't be here to hear you live tonight. But uh, this is being recorded. And so uh, she'll have that opportunity later to great enjoy this program. Let's get into some questions now. Um, I see one here from Frank um, early on. He was the first person to add a question. He said, since they fly, should a lack of a land bridge affect there the raven's migration? Yeah, great question. I mean, they can, they can fly long distances, probably not regularly straight across the, the Bering Strait as they would have to. But even more importantly, as climate change, so does the vegetation on either side of the land bridge, right? So at the time when ravens cross, the, the habitat up there was more steppe habitat, more typical open country for ravens. But in between, there would be times where it was deciduous forest, which yes, there's, there's ravens in there, but not nearly as abundant as in other times. So it may simply be that there weren't that many up there uh, in the, the Russian Far East at times when there was also not a land connection between the continents. Um, but occasionally they could have gone across and they probably did, you know, occasionally during that time, those interglacial times as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and moving along, um, Rick sends a question here. Is it known how far east and south the genes of ravens? from the second invasion of 15,000 years ago have penetrated um, in, into, um, into North America now? Yeah, we, we sampled them all across um, the US on down into New Mexico, um, coastal California and places like that. And we talk about 
these two clades of ravens. The original clade that came over and started to diversify, we call the California clade. They are most common in California, Southern California, and on into the desert Southwest. But we, we detect the uh, more recent whole Arctic clade, we call it, that's all over the old world and the Northern part of the US almost exclusively. We detect those animals uh, at about 50% frequency here in Washington. And on down the coast, their numbers decline quite a bit so that they're, um, they're very rare in California, but they're more common interior in the Southern part of the Western US. So they get down all the way um, to New Mexico, but more commonly would be the, the first wave of immigrants at that time in those, those locations, I should say. Thank you, John. Uh, Barbara uh, checks in with a, a simple straight question. What's the lifespan of a raven? Yeah, I wish I knew. Uh, one of the birds we caught had been banded as a nestling uh, 17 or 13 years before we caught it. We know from Europe there are some birds that live 20, a little over 20 years. But you know, the hard thing about determining a lifespan precisely is you have to have banded birds as nestlings or as a known age. And we can do that for the first two years of their life and then catch them again or observe them again. So with the tagging we're doing, we're hoping to get a better answer for that. And Matthias has a similar study in Europe that we're getting information there as well on lifespan. But I would guess it's not uncommon to have a, uh, you know, a 15 to 20 year old raven. About, about the same amount of years as a, a crow and maybe other members of the Corvidae family? In fact, it may be a little less. Our studies where, we, where we've monitored both crows survive better and I think it's because ravens are often in pretty dangerous situations. They're around mm -hmm. traps. Uh, they're around carnivores, much more mm -hmm. so than, than crows are. So, um, but yeah, similar, in the, certainly in the same ballpark. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mark writes in um, saying, thanks, John. Until now, I've pictured you up in a high tree in Maine, swaying 10 below zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> question, his question is, how good is, Corvus corax at smelling food from afar? Yeah, it's a, it's a question we, we ask ourselves all the time. I don't think it's very good. There have been some studies where they indeed can uh, locate food. And we had some examples where they would come into fisher uh, traps, fisher, uh, the, the fur bearer, um, that were only scent based. So they can find scent, but magpies are really good at it. Their magpies have a much better sense of smell and they are often the first ones at carcasses and other sources like that. So I don't think there's any way ravens are smelling these things from a hundred miles away. But we thought also about uh, one of the people we talked with um, indicated a lot of the chemicals associated with death disperse widely, but you know, these, these animals are freshly killed for the most part. And mm -hmm. um, I really don't think it's a cue that they're assessing from afar, but we're still thinking about it. We're still not ruling that out. And um, yeah, it would be interesting if they were able to sense sights or smells from that distance. I see. So uh, Rick has asked a interesting question uh, regarding uh, your research. He asks uh, any data on how tagging may affect behavior and or mortality uh, of ravens. Absolutely. Uh, I worked on those data a few hours ago, <laughs> literally, <laughs> and it's something we always worry about. We're always concerned about. Um, the last thing we want to do is affect the bird, which doesn't do us any good to understand it, you know, if we we're influencing it. And certainly putting a tag like we've got on these birds does have an effect. Uh, so far, the only thing we have been able to detect is it looks like for females, their breeding success is a bit lower if they're tagged versus if the male's tagged in the pair. And tagged birds have lower reproductive success than untagged birds. We've really, we studied that pretty well last year, um, but we need to do this for a couple of years to see how this might vary from year to year and if it's a consistent effect. 
because we've had, you know, some of our birds are very successful with tags on. We've had a couple of females, those ones that were down in Old Faithful in particular, failed both years in a row, but they nest at the very top of the tree. So there's a, where they'd be exposed to eagles. So there's confounding effects that we're trying to, to weed out, but it's an important question and one we certainly want to get a good answer on and will. Thank you. I've noticed in uh, a number of your images, particularly the vagrant non-breeders that you showed us, Joan, um, the tags were obviously on the wing. Uh, and I imagine that's for easier reading and visibility in the field or not. <laughs> They're actually on their back. Here's one of the tags. Um, and they sit on their back with the Teflon uh, harness that sits on there like a backpack. And the tag on the, and otherwise we color band their legs. I don't put wing tags on. We did in Maine uh, initially, but I discovered in Washington when we did that, they were targets. And uh, we had a lot of folks in the rural area here that were just shooting the birds, I think, because they looked unusual. These tags are pretty hard to see if, unless you're right up close to them. And I think less conspicuous. And we haven't, we've had a couple suspicious mortalities but most of the mortalities we've had thus far in Yellowstone, and since we stopped using those wing tags in Washington, have been um, you know, typical predation events, mainly by owls at night, when the tags, we don't think have a big effect, if any, the birds perch sleeping at night, but owls are, are tough customers for ravens. Got it. So what you just showed us was a radio transmitter, correct? That that mm -hmm. we're calling a tag that fits on the bird's back. Yeah. And that, that's strapped around the wings or, or around the it, torso? It basically, there's a strap that comes off of here and off of here that goes on either side of the wing and attaches on the breast. Got so it. it sits on the back, the wings, uh, it, in between the wings on the back um, of the bird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Dawn writes, uh, ravens do very well on intelligence tests. Do you think that has an impact on their survival and adaptation in the environment or to absolutely. the environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about that, that bird that's living up by Cook City. That's a smart mm -hmm. bird to identify people and learn uh, quickly which ones are friendly and, and which are not and be able to exploit those uh, consistently like that bird does. Um, so their ability to utilize what the environment gives them, I think, is is their strength, and that's certainly powered not only by their um, by their intelligence, but also by their ability to cover vast distances, pretty um, with a minimal, you know, expenditure of energy to do that. Robert writes in, uh, "What is the effect of the raven on the raven population?" of the killing of wolves by hunters. Um, it is open season on wolves in some areas of the US West now. Yeah, uh, a quarter of the wolves that we study in Yellowstone have been killed this year. And um, I don't know the effect yet. We will, I'm heading there next week and we will see um, you know, if the movements of our birds have shifted, if their use of wolf kills has dropped. I mean, ravens will be okay. They will shift to use more human foods if that's the situation. And I suspect that that will be the situation is that they will just rely upon human subsidies even more uh, without having those uh, wolf subsidies available. Um, but yeah, it is a it is a mess literally in the Western US right now with the, um, and in the upper Midwest in Wisconsin in particular, um, with changing hunting regulations and basically Republican-led uh, governments, as I say, giving the finger to the federal government is what they're doing here. They're just over-harvesting this animal for no real reason other than to tell the federal government to leave them the heck alone. Well, thankfully, we, we are um, involved in encouraging breeding populations in some of our national parks um, and hopefully in that in those areas the wolves might be more protected from hunting and especially those who um, don't play by the rules uh, during the hunting seasons uh, within those within those uh, uh, protected areas well these 
the quarter of the wolves killed in in Yellowstone were not in the park. They went out of the park. That's the problem. Like with ravens, wolves cover huge areas, yeah. and they venture into. They're they're used to seeing people not harassing them in the park. They go outside of the park, and the people they see there shoot them. And so I imagine it, that happens in the winter time, the same time when the bison move out of the park, and that's when trouble happens. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is great stuff. I want to keep going, if you don't mind, John, with a, a, sure. a few more questions. Uh, any thoughts on why the big differences between how food is found in Yellowstone as compared to Maine? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the openness of the environment. You can see things a long ways in Yellowstone and in Maine. In New York, you, you're in a deep forest where you don't, you can't see as far. You can't even hear sound as far because of the blocking of trees. And also the, the carnivores in Yellowstone do provide food on a regular basis. Whereas winter kills in New England, uh, they occur mainly at one time of the year uh, towards the end of the winter. And they are much more unpredictable in where, when they're gonna occur than uh, a raven or uh, than a wolf kill is in Yellowstone. So you have more consistent food easier to find food, and it lasts for a, a shorter period of time. So you better get on it or it's gone. Uh, so it's just a, it's a, it's a different pace of life there. Yeah. Uh, a friend of ours, Dawn, just returned from Idaho's Teton Valley, uh, part mm -hmm. of the Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, and she tells us that there were surprisingly few raptors that she saw there, perhaps due to heavy snow cover, but ravens were everywhere. And how is it that they seem to be able to find food when the Buteos can't? Well, um, you know, red tails will scavenge occasionally. Goshawks will scavenge at these carcasses occasionally, but um, they're, they're just not scavengers. They've got to have small game that they're getting for the most part. And a lot of those birds do leave the greater Yellowstone ecosystem because of the snow cover in the winter. R um, Rough-legged hawks come in they specialize more on voles and those that are even subnivian under the snow, and they mm -hmm. will get those. But the real hawk show <clears throat> during the winter in Yellowstone are the eagles. So a lot of golden eagles and bald eagles flock into these same uh, wolf kills that our ravens are at. And so mm -hmm. their numbers are, are, I think, robust in the winter. Um, and the other more you know, live prey specialists like red tails uh, are less. So that, that may be what you're seeing. And then, of course, if there isn't a kill, you don't see the eagles in uh, around nearly as much because they're at a kill somewhere yeah. uh, with the ravens. But ravens are living on the human resources there. And so there's always some around where there's people as well as where there's wolves. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, a new member and a graduate of UW uh, All right. has written in asking, uh, do you know if ravens were affected in the East Coast area the same way crows were by the West Nile virus? Ravens, we don't think were impacted nearly as strongly as, as crows. For whatever reason, maybe uh, this you know, more recent influx of old world genes might have been part of their ability to weather that uh, virus since it was an old world virus. Um, but magpies certainly uh, were killed and crows at, in large numbers, but we didn't have big die offs of ravens. Um, and certainly none of, we, we didn't have birds tagged at that time in Yellowstone, but we did in Washington and we did not see uh, West Nile virus being an issue for them. We did for our crows that we were studying in the same place, same time. Some of it is the, the environment that they're in and uh, the more mesic, warm summer environment that crows live in um, is conducive to big mosquito populations and the spread of the virus. Whereas the drier and colder climates where ravens uh, are more likely to be found is not so conducive to it. So it may be that um, they, they kind of dodged that bullet or they had some immunity from their history. Good question. Yes, and going way back, um, Sherry asks, is it known if the ancient ravens scavenged with early hominids in the US? 
There are uh, artifacts in some of those early uh, human um, human societies that indicate that they did, or they certainly were around them and they influenced them even in Europe. Um, they influenced uh, human cave drawings um, and other uh, caches of food. There, there are raven bones as well as um, prey bones that the people were probably eating. I can't imagine they didn't. I just can't imagine. In fact, I think of us as probably being extremely competitive with ravens initially mm -hmm. as we were scavenging from kills and ravens were right there taking it as fast <laughs> or faster than we could. And I think they forced a lot of our food storage uh, sorts of behaviors uh, in response to that competition. Just a few more questions and then we're going to have to say never more uh, to end this program. Um, I could go on all night, but I want to, I, I, I want to respect your time, John, and you've given us a, a lot of it and a wonderful program tonight. Uh, Mary asks, why did the Raven become known as one, uh, as the, one of the trickster figures, particularly in Pacific Northwest? Well, I think some of it is their um, ability to, to get stuff from us. Um, they, we've got a great uh, photograph of a macaw uh, Indian salmon drying rack. It has a scarecrow built right into it. So while these people were worshiping the raven as a creator, they were also competing with them. So they were tricked by them often. And in addition, a lot of the shamans uh, would transform into ravens, a raven form. That may be part of the trickster idea as well. But I think their ability to seem to have fun with us, <laughs> to provoke us, to challenge us, um, and to, to really uh, be a formidable um, you know, associate in our world uh, probably led to that, um, that moniker as well. Uh, John, coyote, asked, a coyote is another trickster. I should just add to that. So similar kind of behavior, sneaking around, taking from us, being around us, not fearful of us, challenging us. Both of those are viewed as tricksters. Uh, John asks, is there a correlation between increased road kill and increased population of ravens in a given area? Uh, are you aware of any of uh, any of that correlation, John? I don't think it's been shown directly. Um, but certainly they used roadkill a lot where we're at. And we have advocated, um, again, as a way to reduce that subsidy, the state of Montana allows people that if you hit a, uh, hit a deer or an elk, you can, you can harvest that. And you can get an online permit right away. So, so some of that roadkill is taken out of the system by that um, process. And that, that I think helps. There's been several thousand carcasses removed that way that otherwise would have been accessible to ravens and other things. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna end this with one more question, if I may, John. Um, I noticed that your research is focused specifically on the Corvidae family and uh, the rose, the ravens, the jays. And I'm just curious to know myself, why is that? Uh, what is it about these birds that engages your interest? Um, if you will, please. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Um, they're unpredictable. They do different things and they surprise us. Like I thought that, uh, for example, in this study that this would be pretty straightforward and it'd be neat to know how they use wolves, but I expected territorial birds to stay put. And yet I've, we've got them commuting daily, you know, almost a hundred miles back and forth every day. How in the heck they do that, why they should do that um, is surprising. So with these birds, the more you look, the more you learn, the more different you see. I've studied hawks and songbirds and other things, and they're more predictable, still super interesting. I, I like them all, um, but there's just something about being around um, a big boisterous bird <laughs> like the raven and uh, watching it command its environment and everything underneath it. It's really, really impressive. Yeah, so many of the species in that family uh, are really known to be very vocal. Some would say aggressively so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if that behavior is considered a sign of advanced intelligence or, 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 or social development, but it just seems like there's, there is a connection there somehow, uh, at least in my mind. Um, Absolutely. So 
John, thank you so much again for uh, your time with us. I hope you'll come back again some someday and speak. Uh, this was a fantastic uh, opportunity to hear you and uh, really enjoyed your, your presentation very, very much. Thanks, Ken. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, <laughs> but yeah, in the future, it'd be great. Yeah, we'll have to get you, uh, get you into the Museum of Natural History whenever they let us back in the door, that is. Yeah, what a what a shame you can't be there. But thanks to everybody for listening and, and for all the questions. They're great. Appreciate it. Thank you again, John. I hope everyone has enjoyed tonight's Linnaean program uh, and that you all will return in April after our annual meeting in March when we will be presenting Jonathan Myberg and looking for Johnny Rook, Adventures in the World of Caracaras. Until then, my very best wishes to everyone out there for continued safe and ethical winter birding. Stay healthy, stay active, and stay positive, and have a very good night.